This is the Leadership Lessons Podcast, hosted by Pastor Daniel Williams, a podcast to encourage and equip church leaders. Brought to you by eeleader.com. Hey everyone, welcome back. This is episode number nine, season three of the EE Leaders Podcast. I wanna let you know in this time of COVID-19 that we are praying for you. I have a specific list of leaders, pastors, people that I have actually right here on my desk that I am praying for, that I care about. I'm sending postcards, I'm, I'm reaching out, I'm giving text messages, I'm making Zoom calls, and I pray that you do the same. Whatever sphere of influence, people that you're shepherding, that you're caring for, discipling, other pastors, pastors and leaders, that we would get together and pray and love for one another because we are the church. And I think we're seeing that more and more, the unity of the body of Christ, how God is moving and he's using this message and that message and this person and this person. But I want to let you know we are in this together and God is with us. He is moving. He is working. Even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, listen, we don't need to know the answers. We don't know why this is all happening, but we know what the enemy intended for evil. The Lord can use for good. Wow. I feel hyped up. I feel excited. I feel full of life and full of joy because I know that God is using people like you to serve Uh, this world and love other people. And I'm hearing amazing stories of churches sharing food, of doing ministry, of the gospel going forth. And man, I'm just encouraged in this season because I'm seeing God's people step up. And today's episode, we want to talk, I want to talk to you about uh, the micro church, uh, God's people. And what I did is I actually had an interview about a year ago with a friend of mine, uh, Peyton Jones. He was doing a big series with uh, at, a, at a conference with Francis Chan and um, another guy named Ralph Moore about the micro church. And I just pulled him aside after one of these workshops and it was just crammed. I mean, just crammed of people. Um, and I just said, listen, I want to, I want to ask you some questions about this. I think this is, this is something that we need to hear as church leaders. And we need to make sure that we're not relying on our programs and our buildings, but that God's people would, would understand. Because here's the amazing thing. Every time the church has been decentralized, there's been spiritual awakening and revival. What do I mean by that? I mean by the Jesus movement. I mean by the book of Acts. When the church not only gathers, but scatters and is the people of God, and they understand this concept of the royal priesthood, there's been great revival and spiritual awakening. This is one of the reasons why um, Martin Luther was actually, uh, you know, wrote the thesis on the wall uh, and one of those points was the, the royal priesthood of all believers. When, when people understand that they are filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit and doing the things God's called them to do, man, the kingdom of God expands. And we're something so much bigger than just a local group of believers. We're part of the kingdom of God, God's family, which is global, which is worldwide. There are billions of Christians in this world that are worshiping Jesus together. And they have been strategically scattered in this moment. They cannot meet in a building. They cannot meet with all this different stuff, but they have God and that he has been directing them. And he is incredible. He is the, the head. He is the chief shepherd and he is able to use God's people. And so I just asked Peyton Jones a whole bunch of questions about what is the micro church? What are you talking about? How do we implement this? What does that look like? And I think it's a very important subject as we think about coming out of the stay at home order during this uh, coronavirus season. And what does that look like as, as they're putting bands on, okay, you can only meet in groups of 10 or maybe in 50, maybe 100, maybe 250. It's going to take a while and no one really knows how we're going to get back to things. But this I'll tell you, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God. And so I want to make sure that you know that we are praying for you, that you are a part of something greater than yourself, that you are not alone, and God wants to use you. And so this interview about the micro church with Peyton Jones is super helpful. We're continuing our series, Three Minute Messages from the Book of Proverbs. I have another buddy friend of mine, Jim Gallagher, up in Vero Beach, sharing that as well on this episode. And uh, just really, uh, really grateful of how um, people are 
being able to be poured into through this ministry. So thanks for listening. Uh, go ahead, feel free to share these episodes. I'm recording uh, this episode right now on April 15th, batching a few episodes uh, to, to release stuff that I have on my computer to you. I wanna make sure I'm serving you, I'm feeding, uh, feeding you. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at daniel at eeleaders.com. Uh, you can go ahead and reach out to me. You can go to uh, eeleaders.com and get my contact info. Uh, but man, I'd love to Zoom you. I'd love to uh, pray with you, give you a text, be in fellowship. Uh, but I know that as we all are doing our part, God is going to get the glory and we will be the salt and light of this earth. And so keep in there. Hang in there. We love you. We're praying for you. God bless you and enjoy this interview. Hey everyone, I'm here with uh, Peyton Jones, and today we're going to talk about the microchurch uh, methodology system to reach people for Jesus. But before we do that, Peyton, can you just give us a little update about your life? Tell us a little bit who you are uh, for people that may not know you and what you're doing. So I was uh, sent out by Bill Welsh from uh, Refuge Huntington Beach uh, back in 1999, went to Wales, UK, served at Martin Lay Jones's church. Uh, as an evangelist for a few years, helped them plant a church out, went to a Baptist church in the west part of Wales, got my teeth kicked in, and uh, <laughs> Lord was moving, but I, I, I left that church with a broken heart and uh, felt like, man, I can't keep fighting saved people and, and fighting through uh, the church to reach the lost. Yeah. And what ended up happening was I... I quit ministry. Told God I, I love you, but uh, don't want to don't want to work for you anymore. Um, and uh, got a job at Starbucks. I was finishing up a, a ministry degree, and ended up accidentally planting a church in a Starbucks after I quit ministry. Those are just great stories, aren't they? They are. They're and amazing. from there, I went uh, to uh, plant uh, Refuge Long Beach. Um, in the urban core, the, the inner city of Long Beach. That has all kinds of rad stories, but I won't go into them. And yep. then um, I went to train church planners for the SEND network, uh, part of the North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptists. We always say that's Calvary without a dove. <laughs> and um, basically uh, have been training their church planners for about three and a half years. Yeah. And um, now uh, have just gone off on my own again and I'm getting ready to plant a series of uh, churches, almost a network, mm -hmm. uh, based on Paul's Ephesus model, seven churches of Asia, eight actually, if you count Colossia, which got destroyed, so it's not in Revelation, but yeah. uh, we're using that Ephesus model coming up here to plant a network of churches in North County, San Diego. That's amazing. And you also have a lot of resources, uh, books, podcasts. He has a church planning podcast, which you've been doing that for so long. Six years. Now. Yeah, it's been one of the first and um, just keeps on going. Uh, shout out to Pete. I know he's hmm. out there in this world. <laughs> world. Uh, also, hardcore church planning, where you do interviews with other people. So those are great tools, resources. You've gotten uh, a couple of books written, um, and I'm sure you're going to write many more, but the two available right now are Church Zero. Um, that was your first book. Yep. Cha-ching! Cha-ching! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Reaching the Unreached. Uh, Becoming Raiders of the Lost Ark, which are both amazing books, both great books to consider, to think about, to read. So um, a lot of stuff out there. But today we want to talk about, I want to talk about something a little bit um, maybe unfamiliar with people that I'm influencing um, and new language to talk about the micro church. Um, we're here at a great conference, Exponential, and you're doing a lot of workshops, things like that on that. Um, what is your experience with the micro church? And before we get into that, what even is this thing? When we hear about the micro church or cell churches or home church, like what is all that about? Right. What, <clears throat> what, what was, what's that? Yeah, so uh, years ago, we had mega churches kind of like the new big thing. And let me just kind of say at the outset that I don't like to talk about ways of doing church. Um, we always have trends. Pastors are always super trendy. Yep. They love to hop on the latest bandwagon. And I'm not. So if, if I'm going to like the Smiths, I'm not going to like them when they're in the top 40. I'm going to like them later on, decades down the road, when they're not as popular. And the same kind of thing with like, I'm always suspicious of trends in yeah. ministry. But what I want to know is, is this, can you link this to the first century? And what I would say is a lot of our different models 
you can find in the book of Acts. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing about the first century churches. Churches came in all shapes, sizes, methodologies, but micro church is a way. I, yep. I think anyone who comes in and says it's the way is missing the point. One of the people that, that recently is popularizing this is Francis Chan yeah. in his book, uh, Letters to the Church. And, and, and so what, what micro church is, as opposed to, I mentioned that we had mega church, then we had, um, I think it was uh, uh, emerging church, not necessarily emergent, but emerging, which yeah. was kind of a trend that said, maybe we could em engage culture in a way that, that would be effective and we could reach them. <coughs> Sorry, I'm fighting my throat. Um, but then that gave way to missional communities. So I'm just kind of tracing yeah, yeah. these trends here. Mm -hmm. but, but at the end of that, even like the missional communities, that came on the scene with a vengeance and we, we were told that this is the way. But I do a lot of uh, consulting and coaching and I'll have leaders both from established churches and missional churches grab hold of me and say, hey, we're stuck. We're not reaching lost people. Yeah. And, and, and so what happened was we, we found that everybody's still just trying to reach lost people. And when you read the book of Acts, so very little of it happens inside a building, right? Uh -huh. I mean, really the key is getting out there. And so what, what all I realized with the missional church long ago was that you're still inviting others to come to your space, right? Yeah. So whether it's, you know, coming into a building, temple courts, or uh, house to house. I, I actually think that people use our mega church as an illustration of temple courts. I actually think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I think that the temple courts that Paul's talking about is public space. Yeah. And so a micro church is, think of it more like, almost like an outreach gathering. So if I started um, joining the Barnes and Noble uh, reading group, I'm infiltrating someone else's space. Yeah. But if I start my own reading group with the intentionality of we're going to discuss bestsellers, but I'm a Christian, I'll have maybe another couple or another Christian there with me, so we're two by two. But we're starting this thing, not as a Christian book club, but as a book club that's going to interact for the purpose of invading other people's space. Mm -hmm. Then what I'm doing is I'm actually engaging people out there. It's an evangelistic. It is it is going to them. Yeah. And so micro church is almost like a uh, uh, almost like a missional outpost. It's not a gathering in someone's home where we're still invited. Come to our barbecue and we'll build relationship and talk about Jesus. It's micro church is actually going to them. And, and it's not the trappings. It's not, you could eventually doing something like that. Like if you, if you turn me loose on that, that's just what I do. That's part of my gifting. Uh -huh. I'm just going to start something in a public space and in a non-church setting. And a church is going to happen out of that. That's what the Apostle Paul did. That's why in my book, Reaching the Unreached, Becoming Raiders of the Lost Art, we're told this is a lost art. This is how the church started. Yeah. This is first century Christianity. Um, it's that secret that we've, we, we now depend on buildings and funding and those things are great. Everybody wants money in a building. Absolutely. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having that. But if through doing that, we lose the ability to actually reach lost people where they're at, then the conveniences of those things, kind of like if, if you know, you, you have one of those little torches, those little flamethrowers you use to light a candle, uh -huh. but you can't, you know, you watch things like uh, people on, you know, survivalist shows, they can make a fire. If you drop us out in the wilderness, most Americans today couldn't actually make a fire, yeah. right? And then you've got to argue, well, is that a good thing that we're, we have all these conveniences that we've actually lost the essential practices of survival? And I would say the church has done that. Yeah, so it sounds to me like basically other methodologies, um, even missional or mega church, it's a come to me rather than a micro church has an emphasis of go to them. Correct. So now you're in, wh why, why micro? Is it because you're releasing people and empowering them and because it's not a hundred, Christians gathering together and come to us, but now you're releasing them it's and they're small coming. Groups. In, yeah, in it's small. like guerrilla warfare. It's um, it, and the size doesn't matter. Like you could actually have a micro church of hundreds of people. Like okay, yeah, I matter. think that's important for for you to say and to right. let people know because it, 
it's what, where do we even come up with this whole thing of micro small? So the micro just the the reason it's it's because it's not all the trappings. It's kind of like when we send a guy out, we send him out like David, and we put Saul's armor on him. Yeah. And we say, this is the goal. You got to have this mega thing to be successful. It's redefining success. Yep. It's saying our goal is not to become large, right? If that happens, great. But our goal is to reach the lost. And so micro is a way of saying you're focused on the people directly in front of you mm -hmm. at all times. Minimal ecclesiology is really at the core of it. And what minimal ecclesiology is, is that you're saying that you don't have to have all of the things that would uh, necessitate a, a maybe an established church, like a building, like funding. Maybe you don't even have ordained people at it, like an ordained minister. Yeah. Maybe what you're really having is a, is a, a like I said, you, you can have a military base, but then you have an outpost, mm -hmm. right? And that outpost is kind of like the frontier that's reaching people. You know, if we tell everybody, look, you know, like you come to me and you say, hey, um, I want to reach uh, people for Jesus and I'm an RN and I work in a hospital and I've noticed that um, there's really not a lot for people that are, you know, there's the hospital chaplain, but he doesn't even believe in the gospel or, you know, it's a, it's a you know, or it's a, maybe someone from the Buddha, they have a Buddhist chaplain or whatever, but the, she's really burdened for the lost, right? Yeah. She's like the, the, the woman at the well that Jesus meets. She could go tell a whole village, mm -hmm. but we put all these limits on her. Right? Jesus lets her go just be turned and she brings a whole village to Jesus, right? Yeah. We would have all these rules and hey, no, you're not ready yet. And we, we tend to hold people back. Yeah, first, you know, take this class and then be a Christian for five years and right. do these things, the right things, and yeah. just yeah. read these books. You know, and, and and so what it is is we would kind of tend to um, not release people in their gifts. Whereas what, what a micro church would do is it would start seeing, okay, that is the start of something. God is calling this woman. What we do is we use the church as the vehicle and we say, oh, well, you know, we're not really into that, but, um, you know, just keep praying, you know. Um, but we, we let the, the, basically the, the, the ship, um, we, we won't put a little lifeboat out there to save people. We're like, no, the ship's not going to go by that island and check if there's any castaways and rescue. What we're doing is we're saying, we'll take a lifeboat and go there, see yeah. what happens. So, so what we're doing is we're empowering everyday believers in their gifts. And, and, and maybe a bigger word to use is calling. Like who's to say that that woman's life calling yeah. isn't going to that hospital and starting something up where she's not dependent on me as a pastor or a leader. I'm just letting her again, like the woman, you know, sitting at the well, just going out there and doing what she's gifted mm -hmm. and called to do and actually burdened because I'm not burdened for that as yeah. the pastor of the church. But here's the thing that I always have to ask. Um, when I start talking to leaders, the reason I use the hospital illustration is in Matthew 24, like when people go, oh, we don't know what outreach is to do in our city. Yeah. Jesus told this in the parable of the sheep and the goats. He laid it all out. He said, look, if you're my follower, these are the people you're going to go after. You're going to go after the hungry. You're going to go after the poor. You're going to go after the oppressed. You're going to go after the sick. You're going to go after the in prison. Like right there are five <laughs> key people groups, like yep. conditions that Jesus says, if you're one of my followers, you're just going to be doing this stuff. And someone comes to us and says, hey, I want to do that. And we go, oh, no, we're, that's not our church's focus. We have our five-year plan. This is what we're doing. This is our sweet spot. And to me, I said I wasn't going to say things are the way, it's a way, but I'm going to say those are five crucial ways yeah. that we, by not empowering our people, and that's the key of microchurch. Microchurch is stripping back all the trappings and releasing people. Yeah, and, th and that seems more like not a trend. Microchurch may be a trend, but that seems more scriptural, biblical, of what Jesus said, what the apostles did, what we're commanded to go there for. Right. And that go there for, yes, obviously we think about missionaries going into all the nations, but as you are going. So literally when you become a mm. Christian, you are a missionary. Right. You are sent. Right. And to be a disciple at the church, the institution, the, the big mega church, whatever, they need to have the language to be able to say, you know what? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Go and do that. Right. Release you in power and give that authority. So what... 
it sounds like there's not a lot of control from key leadership or, um, you know, I don't have the gifts of compassion, but hey, I, I endorse it, I bless you. What are some of the minimal things of the, the out, you said like the outpost, what are some of the minimal requirements of a, what a micro church would have to be? Um, like, can a non-believer start a micro church? Can they just hang out and have coffee? Well, mission people, always has that two by two right? factor. So I would always say like, if, if that one came to me, one of the first things I would say is you grab hold of another believer. You don't okay. do this alone. That's always got to be key, yep. right? That's just the, the basic bare minimum of missiology is you have to have at least two, uh -huh. right? So um, as that happens, um, what what I want to see with with like a, you know, minimal ecclesiology, there's about seven or eight things, which, you know, you can look it up online. Like it, it doesn't really Yeah, and this apply. isn't like the hardcore, but just to give people a framework to yeah. think when they're listening about this, like, oh, well. well. Things, like, things like basically taken from Acts 242, right? Um, which if, more scripture again? Yeah, more scripture. Yeah, okay. So Acts 242. Um, it, it, let's just let's just look at this for a second. The first church plant outside of Jerusalem was unsanctioned by the apostles. Yep. It was an illegitimate rogue church plant. How did it happen? Well, okay. So there's a saying that Acts 8:1 happened because the church refused to obey Acts 1-8, mm -hmm. right? To, to go out there and you'll be my witnesses yeah. starting in Jerusalem and Judea. So Paul becomes a church planner even before he saved, right? He says, hey, I was called to be an apostle set apart from my mother's womb. Like he wasn't just waxing lyrical. He knew that this is something I just did even before I saved. Even when I was persecuting the church, I drove the believers out of Jerusalem up northwards and church plants just happened. Like I was always going to do this, right? <laughs> yeah. So so the Apostle Paul, so here's the thing though. Those people, there's no name that we can, like it's not Apollos, it's not Titus, it's not Paul, it's not Barnabas. Who planted that thing? Well, we're told that uh, in Acts 2.42, um, that the believers gathered. Now, the believers are the key. They're the subject of that sentence. Yeah. It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. So there's your minimal ecclesiology. The apostles' teaching, right? Orthodoxy, prayer, fellowship, those things. Mm -hmm. um, that is all part of your minimal ecclesiology. That was a church, yeah. right? Now, when they went and established something up in Antioch, why was it? Why did that happen? Because each one of them, when we look back to the time where the church was the most powerful, we quote Acts 2.42. That's mm -hmm. everybody's dream sequence of what church should be. You know? yeah. So when that happens, naturally people begin to develop in their gifts and calling, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what we see up, up north happening in Antioch was exactly that. It was believer led ministry. Now I believe very strongly in ordained ministry and that is one of the eight uh, of, of um, minimal ecclesiology. You still believe in ordained leadership, yeah. but it's this idea that there is a base mm -hmm. and I am releasing people as or I am reproducing, making disciples, training others up, training, equipping, and releasing. I'm releasing that woman into that hospital with others to do the work of the ministry. Which I feel like uh, if you're an established pastor, you would sort of know that model because many missions or visions are like to, you know, catch, teach, and release and those type of things. So so basically but, but you have to actually- But we do it program. Yeah. So what we do is we keep it all, oh, well, we don't have a hospital ministry, a program. We still want to own it, control it, and then, you know, basically we, we stifle it. Yeah. And so basically, instead of thinking about it promatically, we base the mission from God's people. So we use God's yeah. people, not a program. And that is a philosophy that we can say, well, duh, that's yeah. biblical. Right. Um, and so wh why do you think it's so important for us to embrace different methodologies as we go? There's trends and there are good trends, bad trends, yeah. but to base it back on scripture and to say, okay, this is, this is what, this is, this is micro church, whether you like that language or not. Um, to base it back on scripture and how you apply scripture to today's culture. Well, for me, it, it always feels like we're rediscovering. Um, when, when, when we're talking missiology, 
I would hope that the goal of most people isn't to find some new novel way um, because I don't know about you, but every time I hear some new thing, I'm like, oh, here we go again, yeah. right? I don't care about what somebody's new hip way is of reaching lost people. Um, what I care about is rediscovering. Um, the, the, that's why it's becoming Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's that scene where they uncover the Ark of the Covenant and the Well of Souls, and it's been <laughs> hidden there for like, you know, thousands of years. Yeah. And, and they uncover it, and it's exciting because we go, oh my gosh, there's this power down there, right? That they're getting ready to unleash. For me, the more that it's kind of like back to the future, the more that I'm looking to the future, the more mm -hmm. I need to honor the past. Yeah. And, and by the way, um, Microchurch, if you want to really understand, I mean, look at Calvary Chapel. Yeah. Wasn't Calvary Chapel's history this very thing mm -hmm. that Chuck empowered? I mean, Chuck had minimal ecclesiology. Chuck was like, someone comes up to him and says, hey, I want to plant a church. And Pastor Chuck says, let me pray for you. <laughs> the Lord bless you. And he sends him out. There's yeah. no rules. Ed Setzer said that Calvary Chapel is the most prolific church planning movement of the 20th century, literally because there was freedom to move. There are a bunch of yeah. hippies without control. Chuck did not control it, right? And so uh, as we look at this, John Wesley, throughout history, every time the spirit falls, mm -hmm. you have a re-emergence of micro churches. Like people don't know that Harvest was Lonnie Frisbee, uh, doing a little youth group yeah. in a, 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 an Episcopal youth group in Riverside. And that eventually became, you know, when he left the movement, Greg Laurie came and took that over. Boom. It, there were all these little gatherings all over the place yeah. that were just starting up. People meeting in each other's homes, people going down and worshiping on the beach and talking to people about Jesus. There was this just getting out there that was happening, like they were going out into public and they were doing the, they were infiltrating other people's spaces. Yeah, which our normal language would just be, oh, look, it's revival. Right. Spirit of God's it, doing that's something exactly. new. Well, isn't it, isn't it interesting though, that when we use the word revival, what we describe is microchurch. Yeah. What we're seeing in the New Testament where Paul goes, and it's different every time, whether uh -huh. he's meeting with a small group of ladies down by the river in Philippi, yeah. right? Or he's in Athens on Mars Hill, and he's, he's just speaking the Areopagus, and he's meeting with people, and he says, well, come to the synagogue, and we'll talk more about it, right? Yeah. So these are the things that Paul's doing. He's practicing microchurch on the frontiers because that's the easiest way to reach people, to infiltrate their space. What the church has been struggling with for a long time is how to get people into our space. I don't think that's a conversation we need to be having. Yeah. And when John Wesley in the 1700s, when the spirit fell in that movement, mm -hmm. what we actually had, we good? Yeah. When the spirit fell in the 18th century during the, the Methodist revival, um, it was John Wesley who was like, look, I don't wanna leave the Anglican church. I don't wanna go outside of it. I just know that if I go and preach the gospel in the open air, I'll reach more people, I'll invade their space. Yeah. And when I, when I leave it, what will happen is I'll start discipleship groups called experience meetings where people just share their testimonies mm -hmm. and they ask a series, a very short series of questions. And that became one, like within a matter of decades, one tenth of the British population were Methodists. Yeah, and I think that's so important to understand even movements and history and how God's work because how do we discern, oh, is this just a new fad or is this biblical or whatever? We can actually see, yeah. what, would this happen again? Right. And, and this is okay? Right. And we can be excited because usually when the Spirit of God's moving and people have discernment, your spirit comes in agreement with that and you say yes and amen. Yeah. And so that's really important. And, and, and the key takeaway from that, uh, to answer your question, is we're looking back. So when we look back at Calvary Chapel's origin, we're looking back at Acts. Yeah. We're, we're looking through a telescope. That, that telescope says Jesus movement. I can see Acts more clearly. Retroactively, I look at the Jesus movement, I go, that's what was happening in Acts. Mm -hmm. See, when I started church plan, that's what I started doing. I started rediscovering parts of the scripture because I was going, oh, that's what Paul was doing. Because in Europe, that was all that worked, yeah. right? And so we found ourselves retroactively rediscovering the book of Acts and going, oh my gosh, there's a methodology here. 
course, it be begins with the Holy Spirit. You can't strip him out because Absolutely. the whole book says, if, if Luke's bending over backwards to tell you one thing, is Holy Spirit stupid, right? Yeah. But then after that, well, you look at Paul and you go, oh my gosh, and why? I, I remember having this crisis in my ministry where I was sitting on staff at a very large Calvary Chapel looking out the window going, why is everything I do in my nine to five look nothing like what Paul does? Mm -hmm. Why am I not infiltrate? Why am I not out there like Paul was? And yeah. that, that became my unraveling. And eventually, as I chronicle in Reaching the Unreached, how God started reconstructing what ministry was for me. And, but, but then I pick up another telescope that says the Methodist revival, right? John Wesley, George Whitfield. Yeah. And I look through that telescope and I go, oh, I see even more. And, and so every time the Spirit of God moves, I'm looking back. And so I think our job is to rediscover what the Holy Spirit laid down for us in the book of Acts mm -hmm. and said, hey guys, pay attention to this because I'm not going to stick you with one model, but I am going to allow you to glean some principles. I'm going to show you what mission looks like that you can apply to any context in any age. Yeah. Okay, so we look to the past and talking about this uh, work of the Spirit of how He uses um, what we're calling microchurch and um, scriptural base of just how He works. How are we seeing that not only in the past, but right now in the present? Where is God moving through this movement of releasing people, their calling, um, and the microchurch? Yeah, so I think the, the most, com or the most uh, popular example that we're seeing right now, um, there's two that I can think of. One is Brian Sanders. Um, he for, uh, formed something in Tampa called The Underground. Uh -huh. um, that's getting a lot of popularity. Um, Brian has basically taken this idea of personal calling for every believer. Yep. Um, like for example, one of the micro churches um, is a gathering of homeless people that meets together and what they do is they, they record music together. And a church is that that's, it started as an outreach. That's the key with the micro church. It starts with outreach yeah. and it forms a community on the front lines in an outlying uh, place where the church isn't penetrating. So Brian Sanders has done that. He's had about 200 um, micro churches start out of the, 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 and they form collectively a bigger network called the underground. Yeah. <clears throat> the second one is Francis Chan, who, of course, wrote the best-selling book now, uh, Letters to the Church, mm -hmm. where what he's doing is he's challenging the church to rethink their approach. And he's saying, look, maybe we're missing the, the bare essentials of what we were called to do. And because of that, we're going so slow, which has been a common theme in, in all of my writings as well, Church Zero, which yeah. was really uh, micro church in the bud, you know, kind of in reaching and then reach the same thing. Because what we did is we planted um, churches. And, and so here was my kind of uh, desire. I, I didn't want to plant a church. Like I never wanted to be a church planner. I didn't even want to be in ministry anymore. Yeah. But I couldn't switch on. I didn't have a light switch internally, having been called to ministry, even though I didn't want to be in it anymore. I think all ministers have this love-hate with it at times, if uh -huh. we're honest. But I couldn't switch off a passion for lost people. So I never, I never lost that. So I, my heart would still break for lost people around me. Mm -hmm. So um, when I went to plant a church, it wasn't my goal. Right? I just was like, I just want to reach lost people. And if this is a vehicle to do it for the next few years, great. Yeah. If it blows up and blows apart, I don't care. But at the end of it, I just kept training others up. So we would have these small groups that would start up. And these were micro churches. And I knew at that time, I want each one of my small groups to become its own church. Yeah. So I think what we think is, oh, well, you know, we'll have small groups and that'll keep the believers busy and teach them better and it'll babysit them midweek and maybe it'll get them more committed to doing more church chores and giving more money and attending more regularly and they'll be the core, you know, they'll, yeah. you know, and, and they'll be my followers and supporters. That's bull crap. Like that's just, that's not even kingdom minded. Yeah. You know, um, you're, you're basically looking at people, using them as a commodity to serve your thing. But when you flip that around and you go, they're not following me, they're, they should be following Jesus. And that means following Jesus to where he's actually at, which is out mm -hmm. on the frontiers. Jesus doesn't, didn't set up his house in in my church and say, fill my church. 
Jesus said, I will build my church. And that means expand. And he says, and when I build my church, it's going to go right up against the borders of the gates of hell. Yeah. Well, so that's an ever-expanding kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so when I pour into others, they naturally will do that. And they will naturally get out there. So I wanted, I wanted to multiply because I figured more churches out there, expanding kingdom, more lost people reach. Yeah. So I would have college students that would start up like Xbox tournaments and invite their friends and their friends would get saved to this because every other week was like a Bible study or we do cooking classes for single mothers uh, because we met with the mayor or we do uh, a film club or we go into Barnes and Noble and do another book club. Yeah. And we would just start these things up not knowing that they were called micro churches. It was just, I would ask my people, what do you like to do? Go do that thing yeah. and do it with non-believers and take people with you and pray into it. Pray before it. Ask God to raise. I mean, there's almost any film. You do a film club. You get, there's two things that are key to reaching lost people. One is getting them to talk. That's okay. why the most evangelistic book in the Bible is John's Gospel. Yeah, conversations. Because it's conversations with Jesus, right? You get lost people talking, doors open up. If you just think, ooh, you know, I'm just going to nervously, like, you know, I'm nervous, nervous, don't ever shouldn't, then you just suddenly vomit on somebody for five to ten minutes, the most ineffective form of evangelism. You start off asking people what they think, you've just given permission. After you listen to them, there's like this common courtesy in our society mm -hmm. that now I can share with you. Yeah. And I just listened to you for five or ten minutes. Now you should listen to me. And then, and it's, it's you do dialogue back yeah. and forth. Second thing is food. That's why in the Bible it says you got to have the gift of hospitality That's as right. an elder. Because being an elder, you were, you were not just babysitting Christians. You were, if you were an elder, you were part of a forward-leaning, outward-focused movement. The church was a force, right? It was a missional presence. So... To be an elder, you had to be opening up your home to lost people. So when it says given to hospitality as a requirement, hospitality for them was for outsiders. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. So uh, so, so those two things would be like the two sides of the coin for, for gospel or mi missional engagement with people. So it doesn't matter what your micro church looks like. Have, have those two things going in. So if I'm doing a reading group, maybe I want to have kombucha and some snacks or something, you know, wine and cheese. I mean, whatever turns you on, you know, I mean, yeah. you, you do your thing. If it's Xbox night, you, but you're going to have pizza and, you know, soda or whatever, but you're going to, you're going to open things up eventually um, for people to just be turned loose. Yeah. And here's, here's what I love about the microchurch movement, the language, uh, it's creating awareness to go back to Scripture and to make the focus lost people making disciples. Right. Sounds Absolutely. pretty good to me. And it always right? comes back to that because we will find weaknesses, rest assured, mm -hmm. with microchurch. So, for example, um, if we talk about the things in Southeast Asia, and you do anything, megachurch, everybody talks about the weakness of that. We know there's weaknesses, right? Yeah. It's it's kind of like there's this YouTube video went viral where the guy's like, I love my all-star breakfast at Waffle House. We know it dirty, but we like it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like you, you will find weaknesses with every expression of church. Missional communities, that was all the buzz. That was going to change everything five years ago. Yeah. And um, now, and, and even back then, I didn't jump on that bandwagon because I had never done that, right? Yeah. But, but the reality, to a certain degree, some of what I did was that. But I had already latched on to this because in Europe, that's what we had to do. But yeah. like the missional community, we've seen the underbelly of that. Microchurch has an underbelly. Yeah. So, for example, um, in Southeast Asia, where there's this rapid um, multiplication expansion, they have not been able to keep up with the teaching. Yeah. So, so the Apostles' Doctrine, we talk about minimal ecclesiology, um, there's a lot of heresy mm -hmm. going on when the, when the rapid multiplication goes too fast, just like Paul found after Galatia. Yeah. So he goes, oh my gosh, I've, I've, I've got to start collecting teams. This is going full circle to how we started uh -huh. because I've got to deposit leadership there that keeps this thing on the rails, keeps it on the, on the tracks, make sure people understand the gospel and they don't fall into heresy. So everything that we're talking about is eventually 
because we're putting our human language on it and we're the ones making the definitions. Yes. And that's why I think it's always that kind of, you know, uh, always reforming is kind of the cry within the, the, the Reformation. That was, they uh -huh. during Martin Luther's Reformation, they didn't feel like they had, um, the, it, sim, simper referendum is how they put it, always reforming. They didn't feel that they had it. They felt like they were just beginning to rediscover yeah. the, the reformation of the church, the, the rediscovery of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be our cry through the ages. Yeah. As soon as we say we got it, any movement that's done that has started to decline. Yep. Uh, any any uh, practice that does that calcifies all new wineskins eventually become old wineskins. I talk yeah. about that in the book. That's just the way of it. Any the Methodists, right? I'm, I shouldn't start slinging names out there, but every incarnation yeah, you look at of history, the, it's just it's just like that. And the spirit goes, you know what? You guys are stuck now in your ways. You think what you did. And I, well, I'm still trying to get you guys to understand. And so the spirit has a fresh outpouring and we have a new expression. And see, that's what I love about the micro church, the missional movement, the mega church, that God is alive. And right. so he works with multiple people. And so, like you said, I didn't even, I missed the missional movement because like I was just doing the micro thing already because God knows us. He's called us to certain things. And that's why it's great to celebrate the mega church. Yeah. They have strengths. And they have weaknesses. That's right. It's great, great to celebrate those that are on mission in missional communities. And the, it's great. There's strengths, but there's weaknesses. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is, we don't have to worry about that if we're focusing on lost people making disciples, because in our weakness, He is strong. Yeah. Amen. And so we're just to do what God's called us Amen. to do, and to be sensitive, and mature enough to know, well, this is how the Spirit of God is moving, and if He can call us into that, we should obey out of worship and obedience. Amen. You know. And so. Right now, it's micro church, but it's always about reaching people. It's always about discipleship. Can you give us any last words of encouragement um, on just to embrace that? No matter where we are in our leadership, uh, whether we're just a leader in our household, uh, at our church, uh, senior pastor, church planner, how do we just keep the focus on Jesus, worshiping Him, reaching lost people, making disciples and can you encourage us again you know we were given the new testament for reason and we think we know the new testament because we taught through it but we still read it through a 21st century western paradigm yeah and you know it you only have to like sit go to a messianic temple for a while and have your mind blown as you put a new lens on and start reading oh my gosh you know or Maybe you learn Greek and you start, or there's just, you know, Ray Vanderlaan goes to Israel and goes, well, let me show you what it was like in the surroundings when Jesus said this and boom, your mind's blown. Yeah. And I think we need to always be questioning our paradigms. Just we inherited a system in our age and in our time. Now we can look back on previous paradigms that we inherited. Like, for example, for me, I, I think sitting in rows in church is the worst thing you could possibly do. But that's because I started a church in a Starbucks sitting around and I saw the one another started coming out. And I saw that if you create a, an atmosphere where people sit in small groups in church, and that's what my church services look like. Uh -huh. They're sitting in half circles and we open up for discussion and we have group leaders. And so all the richness you get in a small group, boom. Well, I think that's how the early church functioned because scholars tell us there was a lot more discussion and the one, you know, there's 23 one another's in the New Testament. How do you do one another's when you're staring at the back of someone's head? Now yeah. I, would, I would poke at that a bit and I would challenge on that. But for me, it's never been a question of, is it a new thing? I think we have to always ask, not is it a new thing, but is it a New Testament thing? Yeah. And if good. it is, let's get back to it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time. You've been a, a, an amazing encouragement to me personally, having a voice, uh, continually doing things that um, could seem out there, but are totally scriptural, totally amazing. And uh, uh, you've blessed me just through your podcast or your books and just your life man so Thank i just want to at least say that on video to make sure y'all <laughs> know that uh i love i love you man and uh, i'm you, just brother. praying for you and i appreciate you man i appreciate it thanks yeah. this is a three minute message brought to you by redemption church delray beach Hey, Redemption Church, Delray Beach. This is Jim Gallagher, Calvary Chapel, Vero Beach. 
understand you guys are working your way through the Proverbs and want to take a moment to share with you sort of the heart behind the Proverbs as a whole. Solomon said that uh, his purpose in writing was to give, in, to give instruction and to give wisdom. He tells us that the start of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In other words, we get in that position in life, we're trying to figure out what the right decision is to make. Should I go left, should I go right? You know, should I, should I stay here or should I move on? And, and we are constantly faced with those kind of decisions. And Solomon tells us that in the equation, as we're trying to come to that conclusion, we have to start with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a big concept, it's pregnant with ideas, but to simplify it, the fear of the Lord is simply desiring to please God first. And so as we start to make those decisions in life, the first part of our equation should be, what will please God? Is this something that the Word of God addresses? And if so, what does it tell me to do? Um, Solomon went on in chapter 8, verse 13 of the Proverbs, and he said that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. In, in other words, there's this contrast that happens between pleasing God, doing what He wants, doing what's, what's pleasing to Him, and then hating or avoiding that which displeases Him. And I, when I look at that verse, I always think about, you know, if someone were to put food in front of you that you really, really don't like, and you kind of just push it away, just push it back, just go, not interested. And as we're seeking to make those decisions, we, we want to please the Lord, and we want to remove those things that are unpleasing to Him from our life. So God bless you guys as you seek to honor the Lord with your daily decisions, and you seek to use the Proverbs to help you do it. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for listening to this Leadership Lessons podcast. You can watch all the episodes and get all the show notes at eeleaders.com. If this podcast was a blessing to you, I would love for you to share it with your friends on social media. You can find us on social media at eeleaders. You can also help us spread the word by simply writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. My hope for you with this podcast is that it will encourage you and equip you to continue to serve Jesus. Because remember, there's nothing better than doing what God has called you to do.